Hello and welcome to the Music Works podcast. I'm Katie Beardsworth, director and founder of Polyphony Arts, and today I'm delighted to welcome composer Michael Stimson, who is going to talk about his work, The Angry Garden, which was released as a vinyl LP on the 26th of October 2021, and which features the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and the City of London Choir, conducted by Hilary Davin Wetton. With a beautifully poignant libretto by poet and author Simon Ray, and enhanced by four outstanding soloists, this five movement work explores the world from its creation through to its potential destruction by human action. The piece premiered in 2002, but with the current UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, taking place as we are recording this episode, the release of a work that takes as its subject the environmental and climate crisis we are all facing could not be more timely. Stay with us to hear Michael's thoughts on this and his other work and other ways the music business can work to be as environmentally friendly as well as equitable as possible. But first, here's a message from our sponsor. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz offers a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment with protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. And, unlike home insurance, there's no excess to pay on instrument or accessory claims. At the moment, Allianz have a special online offer with two months free cover. Not only that, every Allianz music policy now includes free legal assistance and support, so you can protect yourself, both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliancemusic.co.uk. Allianz, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. So now let's go over to the Music Works studio where Michael is waiting to speak to us. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. So today uh, we are with Michael Stimson, acclaimed composer, and um, in particular to talk about his latest vinyl release, which is called The Angry Garden. So, uh, Michael, without further ado, please do tell us about this really fascinating work. Well, the work was conceived a good 20 years ago and actually premiered in 2002. And it was written to highlight the issue of climate change, which had at that time very little public and political awareness. So I was planning a work for choir, solely and orchestra, and the Angry Garden lasts about 35, 40 minutes and is five movements. And I worked on the libretto with the poet and author Simon Ray. And it's interesting because even 20 years on now with this release of the recording, it's amazing just how well the words have lasted and how beautiful they are. And I should say were wonderful to work with as well. But we realized that with climate change, you couldn't have a piece that just banged on about climate change and full of angst and so we decided to take a longer term perspective and actually the piece begins with just the sound of the tam tam and uh, there's a little sort of scratching sound from a kibasa and gradually for the first movement we move into creation of I guess both the universe and the earth and Simon had a wonderful way of writing short phrases that were ideal for a composer to work with. So in that first movement, there's a phrase called Earth Starts Its Clock. And that just has a sort of tiny little rhythm to it that is beautiful to set. The piece moved into Eden for the second movement, which I made rather lush and both like a dripping rainforest and 
had that English presence in the center where I gave a nod to Vaughan Williams. Um, we then moved into the age of the dinosaurs and in the fourth movement, the emergence of man and fire and the gradual, I remember a phrase of that fourth movement, more mouths, more meat, turn up the heat. And so there the drama begins to sort of build until we hit the fifth movement where the whole effect of climate change, uh, another short phrase, the signs of change or, and now the ice is wearing thin and the piece finishes with, and so the prophecies come to pass. So like writing any piece, it's getting really the shape the highs, the lows, where it needs to drive, where it needs to just relax a little bit. That's always a, a really important aspect for me when I'm writing a music, as it would be for any composer. And um, I think that's really why 20 years on, when we came to record the work with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and City of London Choir, it had stood the test of time because some pieces don't for any particular reason, but I feel that this one has musically. And when I came to edit and refine and polish the work for the recording, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised how little work it took. I certainly had much more experience of orchestration and it needed cutting a tiny bit in a few places just to make it move easier. But in general, as I said, it, it had lasted well. Oh, fantastic. <clears throat> Certainly an absolutely wonderful piece. And I do recommend um, anyone listening to um, to buy a copy and, and have a listen. Um, it sounds as though, interesting, the, um, the approach to writing about climate change at, at such magnitude across history i'm not surprised to hear that that stood the test of time um given that it's uh, it seems as though it's focused in on it hasn't focused in on a particular moment in time and it has in fact looked at basically the entire history of the uh, of the world <laughs> and, and... <laughs> it certainly has and i must say on a more pessimistic note and it's something i gave um, quite a lot of thought to one of the most beautiful moments is towards the end where the choir on its own does sing and so the prophecies have come to pass and it was very tempting to finish the uh, music there but actually uh, we started the piece with the simple words of silence stillness emptiness and darkness or they might have been in a different order um, and so I decided to use that at the end of the piece as well, because if the world doesn't sort itself out, then that's where we're going to end. Absolutely. Very, um, very true and very topical at the moment, as we are on the, uh, the week of COP26, as we're recording this and everything that's going on <laughs> around that is... Um, so what tell me about um things to do with the environment and this piece and one of the things that i think is interesting um from the press release about the piece is that you've you've thought very carefully about the um about how you're producing it given the environmental impact of vinyl you've particularly selected a vinyl presser that um focuses on um being the most environmentally friendly producers of um records is that right Yes, that's right. And this area took an awful lot of thought because mm. I decided for various reasons to keep the release of the recording independent. And so it opens up areas that maybe we will touch on later because, of course, the whole music business, as it were, is geared to big labels uh, releasing pieces and uh, and so to go independent is a risk and it has great advantages and it has great disadvantages. But one of the 
advantages of this was that I and my assistant Jim were able to keep a really tight line on the production. And so the CD itself obviously has no plastic and we chose uh, uh, as good a CD production company as we could to keep away from the traditional plastic uh, jewel case CDs. And then for the vinyl, we chose a company called Deep Groove in the Netherlands, who I think is probably the greenest company in the world. The vinyl is recycled and they take care, although I think um, one has to say that one's always wary of companies' claims, should we say, particularly in the week of COP26. <laughs> Um, yes. But it was, it did enable us to make that choice and it was absolutely so closely related to uh, the what the music is about that it was essential to do this. But um, whether it works against in the long run, I'm not quite sure I'd have to reserve judgment on that. So um, were the decisions uh, that you made to do with going independent um, purely to do with how the CD and vinyl were produced or is this, are there other elements of that decision making that you'd be willing to share with us? Well, there are two elements that spring immediately to mind really, that uh, although a company would normally provide you with CDs or you could purchase them at a certain price, I wanted to be able to have an organization, whether it was environmental or an arts organization, or anybody who would benefit from the recording to be able to just sell it for their benefit with um, perhaps I should say, you know, my costs covered and things like that. But in general, I wanted that sort of freedom really to be mm. able to do that and the independent production again enabled me to do that in perhaps a rather freer way than would have been possible. I see. But the other important aspect, I'm sorry I came in there, but the no. other really important aspect is that of streaming and um, it's something I felt very very strongly about from the outset of uh, streaming companies really allowing music to be played for pretty much free without any response to uh, composers or mu musicians in general. And by being independent, we were able to release the piece digitally and actually have control. So for example, on the streaming organizations, there are three samples of the work which can be played for without cost, of course, but the whole work is not available on streaming. And I feel strongly about this and glad that there is progress on it in that it has at least come to government levels that mm. it is an absolute disgrace. Yeah, absolutely. We've done a podcast episode about this before um, last, last winter when the... Uh, government inquiry was um taking place about the um the streaming um situation what, <laughs> uh, what yeah. puzzles me and i better not um get on my high horse too much here, <laughs> feel free um, <laughs> is uh, how the larger music organizations allowed it to happen and mm. that's the bit that really puzzles me yeah there's a huge disparity between what the um the creators of music and the um, organisations involved in um, distributing it um, get out of the streaming model at the moment. I probably would throw in, I'm sure you're aware of all the statistics, but one orchestral manager said to me that basically with all their streams, which run into vast numbers, they earn enough money for about one morning's recording. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a similar um, statistic which I read on a um, blues bands page, Facebook page ages ago, and it's stuck with me ever since, is that if you buy a 
band t-shirt at a gig, you're supporting the band directly in the same way as if you streamed their song 8,000 times. Uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. They, yeah. the, figures, the figures are extraordinary, really. Um, yeah. you, you, you will know them as well as I, but... Um, mm. Uh, These what is comparisons it? that demonstrate how important it is to buy people's vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I wondered as well, um, just on a, to come back to the topic of the environmental impact of releasing um, new music in the context of CDs and records, whether you, I'm sure you have um, other... Uh, thoughts about the environmental impact of the music industry in general um is this something that you've explored the the way that we operate and the way that the impact that it has on the planet i haven't and i probably could well end up maybe saying something that i don't necessarily agree with um, <laughs> I, I think there probably has to be a balance you know um it's very easy with environmental issues to beat yourself up and live with a sort of environmental guilt on anything you do. But mm -hmm. equally, I think that has to be counterbalanced by this pretense of being green and, um, uh, and just, what do they call it, greenwashing, I think, something like that. So... There has to be a workable solution, but I think it is very, very difficult for the individual. I'll come back on to the music industry, but for the individual, mm. we make small gestures of um, uh, recycling and Brazilian president just carries on destroying the rainforest at a rate of knots, which was a hot topic about 40 years ago. So, yeah. you know, or whether it's India's announcement of being carbon neutral by 2070, which came out today. I mean, it's all just nonsense, really. So it's difficult to balance. Um, <clears throat> does the message get through as well? I heard um, the Manchester United football team three weeks ago flew from Manchester to Leicester. The flight took 10 minutes and um, it was a distance of 100 miles. So, you know, the message just doesn't get through and things happen at all different levels from something like the release of the Angry Garden to protesters who maybe block the M25. It all comes in at very different levels, very different opinions. And so coming back to the music industry, I think um, life has to go on. But on the other hand, like the individual, you do the best that you can. And um, hopefully that will make a small effect, but it's not going to have a big effect compared with America taking 40 years to engage with the actual problem or China or India or indeed Britain as well. So, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I have heard, and I can't remember the exact um, figures involved in this, so I would definitely misquote them if I tried to, but I've heard mm. something about the impact of if we all stopped using plastic straws forever as against what one big organisation could do if it just stopped doing you know particularly yeah. appalling environmental practices would yes. have more you yes. know would the, it, our own individual impact is is quite minor in that sense and nonetheless as you say we do have a lot of environmental guilt um and and of course yeah. a lot of individual con like quite rightly a lot of concern as well because as you said before it is a very serious and current problem so it's very hard to balance those things isn't it it is, and I think it also probably depends on your age a little bit as well, because, um, you know, is a, 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 a person much younger, although they're very concerned, do they necessarily miss what they didn't know, just as how much did I miss not seeing a dodo, you know, when I was a, a young person very keen on watching bird life and 
Mm. But you know, it so it's it's very difficult to get it, it in is. perspective. On the other hand, yeah. it's much easier for young people to get into these habits very early. My son's school went on an environmental march as part of a green festival. <laughs> He's <Yep>. five. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you know, they <laughs> started them early there. <laughs> uh, it is, um, except that how many parents uh, where I live, they're all transporting their kids down in huge great diesel four wheel drives. You know, yeah, so well. um, yeah. that makes less impact or more impact than the kids going on a march, sadly. But uh, there's always contradictions. There are, absolutely, yes. And um, I could go into various things to do with the problems with transport and <laughs> 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 the conundrums that I face in my own efforts to be green and then discovering that it would cost us £400 to take my family to their grandparents on the train instead of driving all three Absolutely. of us in a car. <laughs> yes. That kind of yes. thing. Well, um, you, but, you better yeah. not start me on privatisation of the railways, but yes. that goes back to the 90s, really. So. I know, yeah, mm. well, and, and, you know, here's an, an example of <laughs> where I'm sure two generations can be equally <laughs> outraged at something. Well, um, yeah. Do you know, it's funny, Katie, um, I had a very nice birthday meal in Lyme Regis um, just a couple of weeks ago where my wife uh, took me. And so many small towns and villages we had drove through and all of them had had, so many of them had had stations that were closed in the 1960s with beaching really it's extraordinary some are trying to revive them but yeah. um the spread of trains particularly in dorset and the south was extraordinary in those mm. in those in that decade oh well yeah <laughs> it, it's nice easy on be restored. <laughs> it's easy on on this topic to just drive yourself mad i think oh. it is isn't it yeah. so well, let's stick to music <laughs> So um, thank you for telling us about the Angry Garden, and and as I've I've said, like this is a this is a show in which we're very happy to um, be very clear with listeners that we hope that they will will buy things and support things that we're doing. So please do uh, buy the vinyl or CD copy of this fantastic piece, um, which has been recorded by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, the City of London Choir, and conducted by Hilary Davin Wetton. Um, and so now, would you like to tell us some more about your work in general? What um, what else would you like us to hear about? Things in the pipeline, things in the past. Well, oh, that's a that's a big question. Yeah. But um, <laughs> what I probably would say is, like the Angry Garden, I've always liked, if possible, to connect to work to a contemporary issue where I can. Not always, obviously, but um, as my composition developed, I really shied away from the more formal musical structures. And, um, and so I really believe strongly that while classical music is steeped in tradition with very good reason, and much of the organization and establishments within classical music are concerned with that. This um, development of new music is very, very difficult, but I think one of the big contributions can be when it engages with a newer and different audience, and that may help it along. But I think we're going through so many societal changes at the moment that mm. that's quite tough to know how much a piece of music really contributes to society itself that's very interesting do you, um there we are going through a distinct period of um as you say societal change and activism i would say i think activism is more and more um, widely spread, certainly in my experience. Do you consider yourself an activist? <laughs> uh, I probably would say I was, but I'm thinking back to demonstrations against the war in Vietnam being mm -hmm. of a certain age, really. Um, but actually, I think um, 
when I wrote my first string quartet for the Allegri Quartet, um, I chose the subject of Robin Island and the quartet marked celebrated the ending of apartheid. And um, I do remember one review said, is this the Billy Bragg of composition? So um, I think it was a compliment, but I'm not quite sure. It depends where you come from, really. Um, but uh, I think in a way, without wishing to come back to the Angry Garden, I am an activist in my mind and probably in that sense might be the most awful hypocrite. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it, I do like to try and make a contribution, but um, and I'm still up for a march on what I feel strongly on. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's, there are more uh, than one way. There's more than one way to be an activist, though. There, there is, and um, I mean, I think uh, I will draw us back just into music. My first opera. Uh, well, say first, the only opera um, that I spent two years writing in 2010, 11, I think. I gave every role to, a lead role to a black or BME singer. And I chose a subject that was really aimed at reaching a, a younger, more diverse audience, um, an audience that would not consider going to a traditional opera for all the obvious reasons. And in a way, that was my own personal protest about uh, what I felt the way that um, art minority artists were generally sort of looked at and treated or respected. And so again, yes, one's making this mental activation rather more than standing up and saying, shouting from the rooftops, this is wrong. Yes, I, that, well, you see, I think that this is very important. And, you know, you mentioned just before the, uh, you know, what impact this kind of thing can have. But I really do think that as it certainly from my perspective, as um, someone in their mid thirties, experiencing this enormous societal shift, um, that uh you know television theater music and everything else has an enormous um impact on how people view the world and how in a different way of doing things can be demonstrated via art rather than you know via as you say and not, not instead of but as well as things like demonstration and sort of uh, you know direct political activism is um it's just really i find it really powerful to to see the world portrayed in a different way with different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. with people reacting to things in different ways um so you know i think that this kind of thing is very important but then i would do wouldn't i being a <laughs> being an activist myself for uh, for various things including the the future of classical music um which you know you alluded to earlier the fact that um or said earlier that classical music is a historical art form um very very much so but again I, and i've said this a few times on various podcast episodes and things i really believe that the the future of classical music has to be in pieces that have relevance culturally to where we are now because as society proceeds we re re resonate less and less with the stories that are portrayed in you know historical operas and so on and so forth um i think it's interesting as well if you compare, say, modern art or art in general to classical music, really, because um, whereas you've got Tate Modern and and modern art is embraced, even if it's a dead sheep in formalin or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, it's not frightening for people. Whereas classical music, the let's call it the establishment, for want of a better word, is just locked into that tradition of mm. older classical music and composers themselves haven't they they of course write what they want but they've alienated uh the general public shall we say for 50 years or more 
and this was enhanced by an intellectualism and other sort of reasoning be behind it. And so I feel that classical music is just wandering around sometimes looking for an identity really because um, naturally all the programs concert programs etc have traditional works i mean just out of interest um <clears throat> because of the angry garden coming the vinyl coming out i just checked one of the newspapers for reviews that probably sounds a bit sad doesn't it but uh, anyway, we'll do it. <laughs> two, two pieces were mentioned. One was Mozart and one was Bach. And um, that, of course, summed it up of where, um, where classical music is, really. And um, I remember one orchestra saying, this is many years ago, just saying that put in a new piece of music even if it's just five minutes and their audience numbers just plummet, really. Um, and so they don't, really. And I often wonder, you know, when was the last work of classical music that was re regularly represented in concert programmes? Takes quite a bit of thinking about, really. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um... Because this is obviously the big challenge that we know about in in this field for for composers is not just getting the work premiered, but um, in many ways that's the easy bit, despite it not actually being particularly easy at all. It's, <laughs> it's about actually um, right. having it repeatedly performed um, and really brought into the the repertoire and into the canon, and that is a topic that you know is being discussed a lot at the moment in the context of how the canon has actually been. Um, has actually formed and how much um you know his history and discrimination and and so on has come into that and um you know you're right i think when you say i love what you said about classical music wandering around looking for an identity that's a very <laughs> a very apt way of describing that um and i often think there are sort of two factions broadly speaking there's a lot of very very traditional and the kind of uh, the kind of concert that you um, spoke about where, you know, introducing one five minute piece of new music is going to alienate the audience, potentially. And then there's the other side of it, which is um, where they've really embraced the contemporary and that it's sort of like the two rarely meet, really, um, into genuinely mixed programmes. It does happen, of course. Um, but yes, I still think we have a long way to go in terms of really understanding how the historical and the current and future classical music can really coexist together happily. Uh, there's a lot that springs to mind there, Katie, from, from what you said. Um, but one of the things that I use myself as a guide, and of course it's all very subjective, is that when I have finished a piece of music, one of the really real questions that I want to ask myself is, would you want to hear it again or play it again if it's a recording? Because I think sometimes you can hear a work that is a brilliant work, you know, so sophisticated, way more than what I write and stuff like that. But there is still something that just doesn't connect you quite in the way that would be sort of helpful to the future of classical music, I think. And mm. um, and of course, people what they write and people program what they like and what they what they want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's quite a pecking order in classical music as well, <laughs> as you as you would well know. Yes. Um, but um, that that because one of the things about whether it's Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, or anything it's all loved and therefore people want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's where newer classical music needs to be as well, that people actually want to hear it again. Yes, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. And um, just before I round off, I wonder, do you have any, any words of advice for um, budding composers or, you know, um, 
people in the audience who are who are listening to you with your your wonderful successes and um and would like to you know hear a few words from you uh for new younger budding composers i'd probably say get a good therapist <laughs> and um seek out and check out whether your grandmother is extremely rich because um it's money that makes it happen, really. And um, the composer at any level, and I'm including myself here, needs every bit of help that they can get, whether it's encouragement or support or, of course, funding or, or just, you know, helping you through the day. I mean, I've often said that the biggest supporter of the arts or my music in in my lifetime has been my wife because she had a job that enabled me to focus in on my writing and uh, of course I did you know have other jobs that helped do it but in more recent years where I've been a full-time composer um, she has been a great support to me and those people who support the arts in a slightly uh, uh, looser and more ambiguous way are extremely important. But what we haven't got in this country is a real tradition of people realizing what they can achieve with a relatively sort of small amount of money or a small amount of support, really. So the, the younger composer just needs to engage in different areas to make something happen. And I appreciate you may not have time for this um, okay. as a little anecdote, but many years ago, I was just um, working on, I just finished for my oboe concerto. And I just happened to meet a lady in Italy who literally said to me in the morning, what are you doing when you get back? And I said, well, we're flying out this afternoon and I'm going to go back to concentrating on getting my oboe concerto played. And she said, I think I might be able to help with this. So I'll call you over the weekend. And by two days it was settled because she knew how to do it. And she was that person in the middle that could actually make something happen. And that's a much greater skill in actually I think sometimes them them writing the music or <laughs> or in interpreting it or playing it. It's that person actually that can make something happen. Fantastic. I'm always full of admiration for them. Well I'm always full of admiration for people who can write music. So you know it goes both ways. <laughs> I'd still clear of them all... if I were you Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well I think any I've I've the last time I tried to write a piece of music was for my uh, A-level music, and I think um, yes, I would agree with you on that one. I'm quite happy sticking <laughs> to what I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Michael. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you, and um, yeah, thank you for coming and bringing such an important topic to us in um, the music as a as a tool for activism, and indeed specifically about um, environmental issues, which just could not be more important. If you want to find out more about the Angry Garden and where to source this important recording, um, along with information about Michael's other amazing compositions, you can go to michaelsimpson.co.uk. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak today. Um, so look forward to chatting more. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes, and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, 
proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.